Hello, um, welcome uh, to this presentation of the results of the eighth quarterly survey on the conditions for North, South and East, West cooperation after Brexit. Um, my name is Anthony Suarez. I'm the director of the Centre for Cross-Border Studies. And once again, I'm delighted that we have with us Ben Rocha, who is a research associate with the Centre and a PhD candidate at Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, ben has been doing these quarterly surveys with us since their inception at the first in, in the first quarter of 2021. Um, so I'm delighted that he's here with us to take us through uh, some of the results that came through the, this survey. Um, the eighth quarterly survey, so this covers the, the, the last quarter of 2022. So this is the final survey that took place in 2022. So October to December 2022 is the period that we're looking at. Um, so very pleased that you could can be with us today. Um, I want to begin by just re-emphasizing uh, some of the things that I kind of set out every time we do this, but it is important. So first of all, it's how these quarterly surveys are, really are absolutely essential tools to give us a, a really a, a good understanding of how the conditions for North South cooperation, North South and East West cooperation are being maintained um, following the end of the Brexit transition period and the beginning of the implementation of the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland. So it's that looking at the relations uh, between civic society organizations and local authorities, their, their relations, their collaborations on a North South and an East West basis, what's going on. This, these surveys are really vital for us to kind of track um, what's happening in terms of that North, South and East, West cooperation, uh, those relations, those collaboration. Um, the surveys have always continued to be aimed particularly at civic society organisations and local authorities on the island of Ireland. And just to, to, to recap, why is it that we're looking particularly at civic society organisations and local authorities? Um, and their, their levels of cooperation. It, to remind us, it's the reason that we're doing this is back in 2017, the UK and the EU in the kind of the prequel to the, the negotiations proper, they undertook a mapping exercise aimed specifically just at North-South cooperation, looking at what, what was the North-South cooperation landscape. But one of the things that they, they um, admitted after they had undertaken that mapping exercise of North-South cooperation is that areas of informal, local and community le level cooperation may not have been captured by this exercise. And to, that, to us, uh, that was a very important and actually a worrying um, admission because lots of the cooperation that takes place is precisely within those areas of informal, local and community level cooperation. So we wanted to make sure that we captured that really precious um, element of North-South cooperation and also East-West, not forgetting the East-West dimension as well. So we were ab absolutely um, determined that we would be able to capture what was going on at that level, uh, not just at the kind of higher levels of cooperation, kind of institutional um, um, levels of cooperation. Um, we are really, really enormously grateful to, to those who responded to that this last survey, the eighth quarterly survey, but especially grateful to those who re respond on a regular basis. And, and Ben later on will kind of point to why that's important, why these repeat responders, these people who come back time and time again to respond to our surveys, why, why that's important. But again, this is where I make this plea. We really do need um, your help, your ongoing help in responding to future surveys so that we really can look at what are the issues so that we can then raise those issues that are important to those of you who are involved in North, South and East, West cooperation. It's really important that we find out from you what's going on so that we can then um, bring these issues um, to the attention of those who have responsibility for maintaining the conditions for North, South cooperation, but also those who have responsibility in the area of East, West cooperation. And I keep saying this, this is, really is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, the protocol, um, the, the, the shape of the post-Brexit context, this is an ongoing 
phenomenon or phenomena and we have to kind of respond to to that in an, in an ongoing manner it's it's not something that's going to be finished um um done and dusted tomorrow um obviously at the moment that we're doing this the, this presentation there are lots of news stories so we're in in beginnings of february very early february and we've been seeing uh stories coming out of the 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 perhaps the uk and the eu are reaching some kind of resolution some kind of agreement around the outstanding issues or, or the issues that are, have been seen as problematic in terms of the implementation of the protocol on ireland northern ireland so there, there's some element of, of positivity some elements of hope um around that uh, perhaps reaching a resolution and again perhaps we, we might mention how how not necessarily where we are at this particular moment but even what was happening in late 2022 how that might have influenced some of the responses to to our survey but just to quickly make this cautionary note um the 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 issues that are being discussed they're principally around the movement of goods um trading issues between um great britain and northern ireland they're not necessarily connected to north south cooperation or not fundamentally connected to north south cooperation or east west cooperation and we have to be mindful of that that we have to continue to pay attention to what is happening on that north south and east west front in terms of cooperation and collaboration so that's why it's really important that we that we get your responses to these surveys in, in the future and I, i'd really ask you to be attentive look out for when we call for people to respond to these surveys follow us on twitter at ccbs cross border um sign up to our border zine and you we, we will alert you to when these surveys are, are coming out so a, a big plea for people to continue to respond and for new people to start responding to our surveys really important that we do that and just quickly that i also want to emphasize that these these surveys and the responses to them they don't just go into research briefings which there will be a research there is a research briefing accompanying this particular survey where we set out in more detail the results the responses to the surveys what they mean um they don't just sit there we actually actively take uh, uh, take on the issues that are coming through th from the surveys um and we do this as a center but we also do this in particular with other organizations who are involved in east west and north south cooperation particularly through the ad hoc group for north south and east west cooperation which the center convenes and just to give you an example um towards the end of of last year um, just before christmas um uh, steve baker um, minister of state for northern ireland former chair of the European Research Group, uh, came to the centre to meet with representatives of the ad hoc group, where we raised directly with the minister some of the issues that have been coming up through the, the these quarterly surveys. So, for example, introduction of electronic travel authorisation, um, wider UK immigration policy, um, cross-border data transfer, um, also, let's say, what comes through, has come through the surveys uh, on a number of occasions the lack of uk government support for east west cooperation in particular um so just to emphasize we actively take on those issues that are coming through the survey so it's important that we continue to get that information from from people who are involved in north south and east west cooperation so i'm going to stop there um and i'm going to hand over to ben he's going to take you through then it, it's, it's, it's the, the 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 results of this eighth quarterly survey looking at them in a bit more detail so thank you and i'm going to hand over to ben thanks very much anthony um hello everybody hello to those who have joined us before and welcome to everybody who's joining us for the first time um, as Anthony says, today I'm going to give a general overview of the results of our eighth quarterly survey on the conditions for North, South and East West cooperation. And then a more developed analysis will be available in the research briefing, which will be launched after this, after this is published. Um, today I'm going to give an explanation of the data, how it can be used and any caveats and limitations we have to bear in mind for our and any subsequent analysis that this data is used for. 
I'll then give a breakdown on the respondents to this survey and then head into the substantive parts of the analysis. So that's namely the experiences and perceptions of cross-border contact cooperation and collaboration both in the north south and east west dimensions and around attitudes to the protocol now in this round of the surveys so that ran from october to december 2022 95 percent of respondents reported that they had completed at least one previous round of the survey and now as anthony said because this survey has been operates on a rolling basis every quarter since the start of 2021 and that there are now a very high number of repeat respondents we are in a good position to be able to infer the shape of some trends regarding the views and experiences of the protocol and the conditions for cooperation in a practical sense with a rather good degree of clarity at this point uh, these insights in the quantitative sense are further developed through the inclusion of qualitative responses so the central contextual questions around um, the political, social, regulatory and material environments. And this allows for more nuanced insights into how response are experienced in these dimensions in these changing dimensions. Um, we also this year have introduced a question to ask for suggestions for concrete ways to improve these environments and how to improve the context broadly defined. Um, we're also asking, as we have done since start, whether, in their opinion, the protocol is a good or bad thing for North-South and for East-West cooperation and collaboration. <clears throat> now, taken together, the qualitative and quantitative information that respondents have provided provides um, invaluable in painting a more detailed picture of the current context for cooperation and collaboration across these islands. Um, one thing we always need to bear in mind with this, as I say, is that we need to appreciate that the respondents to all rounds of the survey, while they are self-selected, each have a wealth of insight and experience and expertise of cross-border cooperation and collaboration. These are experts in the field and people who are practicing in these environments daily. And so the results need to be considered with that expertise in mind. Now, for this round of the survey, the data was collected between uh, during December 2022 and has gathered 41 responses in total. I say 95% report that they have completed the survey in the last quarter and only 5% are new respondents. So welcome to our new respondents. Um, in terms of where the respondents are based or where their business organizations operate, of uh, the 41 responses to the survey, 37% were based in the Republic of Ireland, 49% in Northern Ireland, with 15% having a presence on both sides of the border. So I'd say that at this point, and given that this has been quite consistent, we're having good representation from people both sides of the border, which is which is good to have. Uh, looking to the north-south contact and collaboration, in this quarter, 81% of respondents report having had meetings with organisations in the other jurisdiction on the island of Ireland. For 54% of respondents, their level of contact this quarter has been the same as the previous quarter and has increased for 39% of respondents. This is, again, positive news. It's been the case quite consistently that North-South contact has been fairly robust since Brexit, which is, which is to be welcomed. On the other hand, 72% of respondents reported that meetings with organisations in the other jurisdiction discussed challenges to cross-border cooperation either on occasion for 55% or to a significant extent for 27%. And the nature of these challenges were varied and touched on concerns around access to funding, on cross-border cooperation, and particularly on the pending introduction of the electronic travel authorization for cross-border travel, which will apply to non-visa nationals. Um, finally, they also pointed towards the ongoing absence of an executive at Stormont. So I think one thing to just bear in mind in this is well, conversations north and south are ongoing and are quite stable. They are being taken up rather a lot by discussions around disruption there if we could reduce some of this disruption they could get back to talk about things that would move forward and be more progressive um 81 percent of the respondents are currently involved in cross-border collaboration with a partner in the other jurisdiction and the main areas of current collaboration focus on economic development education and community development and 78 percent of respondents are actively considering new collaborative projects so again north south collaboration is very robust and has been for some time which is to be welcomed 
67% of respondents who are presently engaged in cross-border collaboration projects reported that they were in receipt of funding with the predominant sources being from the Irish government. And that is stands in stark contrast, as we'll see in a moment, to the funding context for East-West dimension. And if we look now towards the contextual environments for cooperation and collaboration, in terms of the political context, 76% of respondents believe that it has stayed more or less the same on the previous quarter, with only 15% saying it's deteriorated. And when we've asked people to elaborate on these dimensions, people have pointed to issues arising from the ongoing absence of functioning assembly. So the lack of devolved administration in Northern Ireland means there is a continuing hiatus in cooperation at the highest levels, which impacts at regional and local levels as a consequence. The funding opportunities through Peace Plus, Shared Island and Reconciliation Fund mitigate the consequences of this political hiatus to some extent by providing opportunities for dialogue, interaction and development. And the continuing political uncertainty owing to the protocol and a lack of executive does overshadow things. I'm going to caveat this, and it will become a bit clearer later on when we look towards the East-West dimension, that there is a sense of greater political stability than there was in the latter half of last year. There's a sense that Rishi Sunak in number 10 has stabled things and there is somebody now taking these issues a bit more seriously and practically, which has calmed some of the anxieties that we were seeing towards the, the summer and autumn of last year. Looking to the North-South social context, 7% of respondents say that it's deteriorated since the previous quarter, with 12% with saying it's improved, which is a nice shift in dynamic. However, the predominant response is that it has remained the same, with 78% of respondents reporting no change on the previous quarter. Uh, when we've asked people to elaborate on this, respondents have mentioned that there is still negativity among loyalist communities due to the Northern Ireland Protocol and that Ireland residents or residents in the Republic of Ireland are reluctant to travel to Northern Ireland, which is something of a concern and something that needs to be monitored in terms of South North travel for retail, for hospitality, and whether that is being impacted. Look into the regulatory context. 56% of respondents say that it has remained the same compared to the last quarter, with 27% saying it's deteriorated. And this one's a particular concern. It's the third consecutive quarter in which not a single respondent has reported an improvement in the regulatory context north-south. Um, when we've asked respondents to expand on this, <clears throat> they've pointed particularly and acutely this quarter to potential regula regulatory divergence between the UK and Ireland and the EU and its impact on cross-border projects. This is specifically because of the retained EU law bill that's progressing through Parliament and response to the retained EU law bill currently in passage at Westminster is giving rise to concerns about increasing divergence of legislation and that it is proposed that much EU derived domestic legislation would automatically be repealed at the end of 2023 unless preserved by ministers and this one I think speaks to perceptions quite broadly that we are only now discovering more and more anomalies in the regulations between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland which impede collaboration and there is a sense that and I'll come back to this at the end, but that while Brexit has been disrupted in a broad sense, now that people have got to sense with the daily practicalities of it, they're now more aware of the specific issues that may arise as Brexit continues to progress and as legislation continues to progress through the Commons. I look into the material context. 66% of respondents believe that it is the same as the previous quarter, with 17% reporting that it, has that it has deteriorated, and only 10% saying that they don't know. And when we've asked people to develop on this, uh, respondents have st stated again that Brexit realities are beginning to hit home. The practical impacts, as opposed to the more affective environment of Brexit, is starting to take hold. But one does note that businesses are working their way through protocol administration to better effect. So having had the protocol in effect now for, by this point, almost two years, businesses and organisations have got to grips with how it is operating as it stands. Obviously, given the negotiations that are going on around changing and adjusting the protocol, this can never be taken for granted, unfortunately. When we've asked respondents for suggestions on how to improve the conditions for cooperation and collaboration in the north-south dimension. This course, they've generally spoken to transport infrastructure, uh, relations with the Irish government and student mobility. 
uh, we can see here that transport communication by rail between north and south needs development and is a barrier to cooperation and interaction including by rail freight uh, that we should explore student exchanges at all levels using erasmus and other such models so things like the Turing scheme and more support from the local councils for the voluntary and community sector would be appreciated given that the voluntary sector do this work for free if they are given more support and more scope they will be able to take on more responsibility and develop their programs in a direction that they would be better able to utilize their time looking to the east west dimension now <clears throat> This quarter, 66% of respondents reported having meetings with organisations in Great Britain. And for 63% of respondents, this was at the same level as the previous quarter. And 20% has reported that their level of contact has increased. So this is good. Normally, the east-west dimension is not poor, but lower than the north-south dimension. And this is looking increasingly robust now. People seem to have found their feet in how to engage with their counterparts east-west a little more. Um, but again, 63% of respondents reported that meetings with partners in Great Britain discussed challenges to cooperation on occasion for 44% or to a significant, significant extent for 19%. And these were predominantly focused on issues regarding funding schemes and potential implications, again, of regulatory divergence. So again, while these meetings are ongoing, they are being taken up to a disproportionate size discussing issues that are arising as a result of Brexit, and we need to be able to get to a point where we can discuss progress rather than mitigation. 51% um, of respondents, they are currently involved in collaboration with a GB based organization, and the predominant areas are economic development, human rights and peace and reconciliation. However, and this is particularly concerning, only 37% are actively considering initiating new collaborative projects with organizations in Great Britain. Now, I can't speak to this with any certainty, but what we can see in terms of the funding is that 43% of respondents are currently engaged in East-West collaborative projects are getting funding. And that's mainly being drawn from charitable foundations. And consistently we see in the East-West dimension that funding for East-West projects come from charitable donations or from the organization's own core funding. And when we look to the north south context and see that the irish government are responsible for most of the funding we really do need to see a shift from the uk government in funding for east west collaboration if we are to see more respondents actively pursuing these opportunities turning now to the perceptions of the contextual environments for the east west dimension 71 percent of respondents believe that the political context for east west cooperation has remained the same since the previous quarter uh, with both 12% saying it's deteriorated and same 12% saying it is improved. Um, when we've asked to expand on their experiences of political context, respondents, as I mentioned earlier, have indicated stability at Westminster has given calls for optimism, that, but that continuing uncertainty around the protocol is remaining an issue. So we've got new prime minister and ministers should lead to some stability and clarity on policy. Uh, but the protocol Brexit lack of government is storm on and lack of will by UK government to engage constructively with the EU until recently. And I think, I hope rather, the until recently is a sign of maybe some shifting moves and some shifting positions that will, will move in the right direction over coming months. And finally, the continuing obstacles with Brexit regard to Brexit, the continuing obstacles with regard to Brexit and the Northern Ireland protocol impact. Looking to the social context, 70% of respondents reported that the social context remained the same on the previous quarter. 12% said it's deteriorated, which again is not too high, and but only 5% report that it's improved. Um, one of the things to bear in mind as we'll come to later is that that things have stayed the same speak to a lower level of expectation, a lower level of experience than we had pre-Brexit, that there was a big drop in 2021 through most of early 2021 that has stabilized throughout 2022 so we're still operating out of context that is below where we were previously and something we still need to return to uh, when we've asked respondents to develop on this they've said that the cost of living crisis is having a societal impact in that focus on cost of living at post-covid has meant groups are inward looking and less likely to focus on looking up and out which is something that I think, while not directly related to Brexit, still will have an impact on how we're able to respond to Brexit and something that needs to be considered in a more holistic sense. 
In terms of the regulatory context, 68% of percent of respondents say that the context has deteriorated over the last quarter. Uh, sorry, has stayed the same over the last quarter, with 22% saying it's deteriorated. Um, respondents have said that there are concerns around the impact of regulatory divergence between the UK and Ireland in the EU, saying that the retained EU law bill may result in greater divergence between NI and GB due to requirements of the protocol, depending on progress of the protocol bill and negotiations. If we look now to the material context, 76% report that it has remained the same since the last quarter and 12% says deteriorated. Respondents have generally pointed towards inflation. And again, the protocol is having negative impacts. And so that some people notice when ordering goods, some are not delivering to Northern Ireland or are charging larger rates. And the inflation is the key issue. Some people have to fly to conferences and increasingly it's easier to get to and from GB outside London via Dublin. I think this is something that is likely to become more apparent, particularly as we head into the summer, that traffic through Belfast Airport may go down in comparison to Dublin as people, particularly EU nationals who are living in the north, will choose to fly through Dublin because it is simply easier for them and involves less paperwork and less documentation. When we've asked respondents for suggestions for improvement to the east-west dimension, they've suggested that increased funding for mobility projects, including teaching staff and demonstration of good practice projects and space to learn and explore from other third sector organizations. So having a more collaborative industry wide project to, to develop best practice in the current context as they stand. And um, given that the protocol has now been in effect to some extent for basically two years at this point, We've asked respondents whether they believe it is on balance probably a good or a bad thing for the North South and for the East West cooperation. 68% uh, of respondents reported that they believe the protocol is on balance a good thing for North South cooperation, compared to 20% who were unsure and only 12% who believe it is a bad thing. In terms of East West relations, 56% believe the protocol is on balance a good thing for East West cooperation with 32% unsure and again, 12% reporting it's a bad thing. So while the protocol is not viewed as entirely positive, it is considerably viewed as more positive than negative. Now, in addition to the open text questions we've asked specifically around the contextual environments, We've also asked response to provide in their own words any additional comments and insights that we may not capture with these questions and that they feel would be beneficial to understanding the impact of Brexit and the protocol on cross-border collaboration, both North, South and East, West. And one responder said that we should continue the confidence building between North and South through soft power, art, cultural language, sport, religion, history and environment, and continue to develop real links to eliminate all barriers on the island go for a strategic project like a rail connection north and south and encourage tourism business between the parts of the island. Rail freight was always a good link in the past and that has been dismantled. Unblock the narrative around the troubles by continuing to study and collate and build reconciliation by respecting the views on all sides, though often appearing hardline and radical. We need proper engagement and negotiation between the UK and EU and a resolution to protocol issues. And we need an end to the UK bill that will replace elements of the protocol and that we need Stormont up and running again effectively. I think this last one speaks to a lot of attitudes and opinions broadly that the protocol needs to be resolved satisfactorily, that Stormont needs to come back because too many decisions are not being made. And that the protocol bill going through the Commons right now is a distraction that hinders this kind of progress. Um, so to summarise then, the uncertainty that pervaded the surveys in the latter half of last year partly as a result of the instability at Stormont but exacerbated by instability at Westminster as Boris Johnson left and as this trust came through it's notably absent this court which is to be welcomed and it does seem that people are of the opinion that Rishi Sunak is now essentially an adult in the room who is taking these matters seriously and will progress them with with some degree of pragmatism what we are seeing, though, is, as I said, well, certainly in 2021 and in the initial half of 2022, the anxieties around Brexit were slightly more nebulous because things were still so much in flux. People were unsure about what was going to be happening, what was going to be affected. What we've started to see, particularly in this quarter, 
is how how intertwined UK and Ireland regulations are, um, and well, both were in the EU, and specifically how the retained law bill has focused attention among cross-border organisations to the potentially profound implications of divergence in a much more specific sense. And um, so the retained law bill and potential regulatory divergence has been a common theme, and I think people are at this point recognising the specifics of Brexit and how these may play out in practice as we move forward. Um, also, pro a prominent feature of this quarter is the increasing awareness of the pending introduction of electronic travel authorization, is something Anthony mentioned earlier. And it's good that people are aware of the electronic travel authorization, given how profoundly it will impact on north south uh, south north travel for non visa nationals. But there is still incredibly limited information coming from Westminster as to how and when this scheme will be rolled out. The most recent update came out in November 2022 and basically scheduled a beta test for the first quarter of this year, started rolling out to people from the Middle East in the second quarter and then going worldwide from 2023. But it doesn't consider how or it doesn't consider explicitly how this will operate at the land border. And organizations and one of the respondents mentioned earlier to develop tourism this will impact on tourism quite profoundly because tour operators will require that their passengers in many cases have electronic travel authorization and so businesses tour operators hospitality businesses services will need to know how this is going to operate in time to plan and basically put procedures in place to develop and i think it's one of the key things that we are likely to see over the next six months is the rollout of the electronic travel authorization and how this impacts on south north travel in the uk government really need to begin producing some publicity materials for this to bring people along with it um finally as i mentioned in terms of the broader context for north south and east west we're seeing a continuation of the trend that a deteriorated environment is becoming normalized and this should not be allowed to continue all stakeholders and especially governments in the uk and ireland and that you need to step up and take, take concrete steps to improve conditions for cooperation and collaboration across these islands. And as respondents have stated, this requires increased access to funding, exemptions from mobility within the island, and for the executive to return to Stormont. And I think I am going to end at that point. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me, everybody. Thank you, Ben. Um, I just want to pick up on a, on a, a couple of, well, as you, a few points, mm -hmm. um, and maybe even starting from, from the end, because you, there in your in your sum, summing up, you referred again to the retained EU law bill, and that yeah. does seem to um, have created some sense of uncertainty. Um, so, so there seems to be, in some ways, maybe slightly more positive um, outlook on the political context. But at the same time, especially when you're looking at the responses to the, the regulatory context, so the political context is kind of, no, no, I don't want to exaggerate, but let, let's just say people are kind of waiting and seeing what's going to happen, but with perhaps a sense that, you know, we might get somewhere hopeful. Yeah, there's a cautious optimism. Cautious optimism, that's exactly it. But at the same time, when you look at the responses to the regulatory context in particular, so... 27% think that the regulatory context for North-South cooperation has deteriorated. Um, there was a, a similar percentage in terms of the East-West dimension. Uh, and there was reference there in terms of some of the comments that they were put in. Um, so, for example, around the regulatory context, people are only now becoming aware of some, some of the anomalies. Yeah, the... Retain law bill seems to have focused minds to what I got. Oh, if this changes or if this goes away, then what happens next? Yeah, so so th that is creating a sense of uncertainty, and that coupled, and you refer again, you're referring there um, to the electronic travel authorization that that tool that the UK government is introducing. Um, and you're referring to the, the, the need for, for, for more clarity, more information. Um, I think. We also need, I think, that this point was was actually, in fact, made um, recently by the ad hoc group to uh, Minister Steve Baker. 
that there had been some conversations previously, some previous ministers had um, spoken of the willingness to exempt from this need to have this electronic travel authorization for those who are legally uh, resident in the Republic of Ireland so that they wouldn't have to apply for it. But yeah, there was an amendment put into the Lords last year, which the government did take out. I'm not sure if there's going to be an attempt to reinstate that so that all journeys on the island are considered local journeys. Yeah, so we're hoping, although we haven't heard anything again on, on, on that, so we're hoping, we're really pushing and hoping that at least that there's some relief there to those who are legally resident of the Republic of Ireland who, who happen not to be Irish or, or let's say UK nationals, uh, they would have to. But obviously that, that doesn't solve the, 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 the problem for the tourism sector, uh, for visitors coming to, 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 to uh, for many visitors who will still need that. Uh, so there is that kind of lack of uh, that that uncertainty pervading, especially the regulatory context. But the other thing that comes out um, is the repeated references to the lack of an assembly, lack of an executive. A uh, lot of people, both in, whether it's the north south dimension or the east west dimension, they, they keep re referring back back to the lack of, of an executive, um, and, and that that again, complicates matters to a certain extent. Uh, and I just want to reference here, it's just happened um, that yesterday, which was the 1st of February, um, uh, I was at the, the launch of a book that's uh, being published by Stefan de Rink, a senior EU official who was, who was uh, an aide to Michel Barnier during the, 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 the negotiations. And one of the things that stood out from what he was saying um, was because there was a question posed to him from the audience around did did he think there was had been a problem that Northern Ireland didn't have really have a direct input into into the negotiations into the discussions and that one of the, he said a huge missed opportunity was the fact that there was no executive during these these, these crucial negotiations there was no executive there to actually take part to give uh, Northern Ireland civil servants some kind of you know, um, so, some backing um, that the, 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 there was no executive there at all. So, um, but, but Ben, just one thing here, just to come back again. Now, this has come up again and again, but I, I just think it's kind of it's increasing. So, on the north south side, 78% of respondents said that they are actively considering new north yep. south operation and when you go to the east west dimension 37 percent say that they're yep. considered so there's a huge split there in terms of those who are involved already but it's also about those who are thinking uh, and looking for new new activities on a north north south and an east west west there's a huge discrepancy between between the two there um, is i just want to again why do you think that is i think you kind of pointed to it but maybe yeah i think from this, certainly the land and funscape plays an impact that the Irish government are, as we can see, investing more or investing more broadly in north-south cooperation and collaboration, while the UK government simply are not in the east-west dimension. That means it is inevitably going to suffer. If people cannot get funding for these projects, they are not going to do them. And I think my intuition is that again the lack of storm and the political environments or political relationships east west are also undermining these well the north south relationships are not great they're okay and the conditions of possibility are there for east west particularly since february last year they just haven't been and i think people are perhaps reluctant to engage in projects given the uncertainty around the east west dimension when you could initiate a project then everything changes and you end up halfway through without anything to do so i think this lack of certainty and the the lack of cooperation at a political level is impacting the lack of cooperation at a civil society level um you just on that uh, i just remembered so just just as an example uh in terms of funding support for east west cooperation Recently, there the Shared Island Unit launched a new fund, uh, it's a, a community fund, uh, which within it uh, is obviously North South is the, the central plan to it, but it also would support East West activities. The reconciliation fund, this kind of ongoing fund from the Department of Foreign Affairs, 
that also, you, you know, it, within its strategy talks about, you know, supporting East-West cooperation. And it's just, again, we, we've raised this um, through the ad hoc group and the centre has raised it uh, as well on, it, on, on its own uh, with UK government um, ministers and officials. It, it's, it, we really, we would like to see something come from the UK government that kind of also supports, provides funding for for that east west dimension but mm -hmm. east west as in both jurisdictions on the island of ireland and great britain and yes. not necessarily just northern ireland and and the rest of the uk it's yeah like, if we can start building relationships between the uk and the republic of ireland that would be to everybody's benefit yeah i, I just I, I just briefly i, I want to comment uh, again on on this lack of a northern ireland assembly but it's also linked uh ben you one of the comments that you put up um at the end there was someone saying that um the cost of living crisis and covid it's, it's kind of perhaps making organizations kind of look inward yep. rather outward because they're dealing with these you know the, the these these pressures um so there's less inclination perhaps to 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 look outwards um I think, and this is a, a worry, and we've ri written about this in some of the research briefings that have accompanied these presentations in the past, um, looking particularly at organisations in the Republic of Ireland in the South. When I, I hope this doesn't happen and that we are able to, to, to kind of tackle it, but it's Organisations Republican Republic like, face the same thing, cost of living crisis, perhaps not to the same extent, post-COVID. Um, they're dealing with all sorts of other pressures, but then coupled with looking towards Northern Ireland in particular, seeing lack of an assembly, uh, lack of an executive, uh, and organisations up here and local authorities up here dealing with that. It, it's it's it, I, There's there's the, the, the potential that organisations itself will just look to Northern Ireland and think, that is just it's just too problematic um yeah and then within the uk wide kind of what's going on in terms of retain the eu law bill and all these other things it just i don't know what you think whether you think that's a kind I of think there is certainly a risk of that and just on what you were saying there i think that because local authorities and civil society organizations are having to pick up the slack from the lack of an executive because there is no executive the heating payments have not gone out until late january had they gone out in november people would not have needed to avail of these organizations resources these organizations could have gone so essentially it's just the lack of executive forces them to adjust their priorities to more urgent and more pressing needs but it means that they cannot focus on collaboration cooperation cross-border it takes the back seat while they're firefighting immediate pressures yeah um, well, Ben, thank you so much uh, for doing this once again. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, maybe we'll end on a po positive note here. Um, it, it, we're kind of influenced by the responses to the surveys. Obviously, the survey was done at the end of 2022, but there was already a sense, as we, as we both said, um, of, let's say, uh, cautious optimism um yeah. even at the end of 2022 and i think that cautious optimism is still there uh, and hopefully things will become a bit more positive and yeah. we'll start to have a better point yeah. well it's not a hard deadline by any of the parties hopefully by the time we get to the 25th anniversary of the gfa we'll have some positive news and some basis to move forward on absolutely thanks ben and thank you to everyone for joining thank us you really really uh, appreciate it and um we'll see you again hopefully when we release the results of the ninth quarterly survey thank you so much bye-bye